Merry Christmas. And I have a prophetic word I believe the Lord has given me to share with you this morning. It's found in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. We've been doing a series of messages on the truths of Christmas. Next week, we're going to talk about the gifts of Christmas. And the week after that, on the 23rd, we're going to be sharing with you the names of Christmas and how they affect us and how they affect our lives. You know, a name means a lot. And if you've never researched your name, it's an important thing for all of us to understand and know. I, um, Elena was not going to be named Elena uh, Nicole, but when she was so sick, we named her Elena Nicole, which means Princess of Victory. And sometimes, many times in the Old Testament, people would put names, prophetic names with their children and today I want to share with you a passage of scripture and share with you some things probably you've never heard on Christmas, but I believe the Holy Spirit would have us do this. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, in verse 37, the angel had just come and visited Mary, the angel Gabriel, and he said to her, with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. The second part of that verse is our text. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. It's a pretty profound statement, which leads me to the title of this message that I want to speak to you today. It's simply titled, A Nine-Month Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for your, the power of the Holy Spirit. And we just ask now that you would touch us with your presence and with your anointing, that you would confirm your word with signs and wonders, that revelation would speak to us. I bind every principality and power and ruler of darkness and wicked places that would hinder the word of God. Let truth come to us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people shouted, amen. amen. You can be seated. I was contemplating this scripture quite a bit and thinking a lot about it. Mary made that profound statement that said, let it be to me, be unto me according to your word. And I, I don't believe that was a flippant statement because of all the ramifications that were taking place when she said that. And there were several ramifications that were taking place, one of which was with the uh, cultural ramifications of shaming your family. You know, Mary went home and told her mother and father, you know, I'm pregnant but I'm a virgin still, and I, I, as a father of three girls, I mean, that would have been a hard one to swallow uh, back then. Even today, um, people have a hard time really contemplating the fact of the virgin birth. But then there was the religious ramifications that came with that as well, because in that day and time, if you were married or betrothed and you were found to be pregnant, that was a death sentence. So when she said, be it unto me, she's basically saying, Live or die, I want to do the will of God. And that's one of the things we don't talk about very much during the Christmas season is that Mary was so consumed with doing the will of God that she was willing to risk her own life in doing the will of God. And as believers during this Christmas season, that's one thing that we have to look inward about again. Is this Christ that we love? Are we that passionate about it? And then the last thing is, is what about the idea of a 16-year-old girl carrying a baby for nine months? I mean, she was just a little girl at that time. It, it, it was not like it is today. The teenager of that day wasn't as far advanced as it was today. It was a whole different meaning. And I was thinking about that, and the first time that Jelly was pregnant with one of our children, Jordan, and I remember that uh, it was during the... Uh, 1983, and it was during the time that they were transitioning. Some of you remember the days when the men waited in the waiting room and the women were in there giving birth, and then they came out and told you what you were. And I just happened to be blessed with the time that the men were invited in to the birthing process all the way into the room. And there was a demonic man by the name of Lamaze that invented some things called the Lamaze method. And, and so uh, you, were, you, were, you were invited into the process to go right into the delivery room, and I was so glad about it. And I missed the first class, 
And that was an important class because the first class talks about the baby going through the birth canal. And sometimes when the baby goes through the birth canal, it has a little bit of a pointy head when it comes out. And of course, I missed that. So when Jordan was born, she had a little bit of a pointy head. And, you know, I thought she, she was a waterhead baby or something. And that threw the whole room apart And because uh, I didn't know. Then we got that. But uh, during this process... Uh, I was there and I was being told all the things. I, I was told I was the coach. And being a type A and being someone that says, just give me the rules and everything, they started telling me that I was the coach. And they started telling me that I was in charge. And they started telling me that she couldn't do this without me. And that no matter what happened, that I, I, I was the key, and, and we had to practice the breathing. He, he, ho, ho, that's the way it was then. He, he, ho, ho, say it with me. He, he, ho, ho, come on. He, he, ho, ho, now you can go in and do it, amen. Tell it one more time. He, he, ho, ho, there you go. And you, you practice that breathing, and, and then they, they give you a little bag that you put the stuff in. You have a little, you, have, you had a little a tennis ball, and you're supposed to rub her back with the tennis ball. And then you, then you have the washcloth that you put in there, and then when she's going through labor, you wet the washcloth, you wipe her face and you're doing all that and you're telling her we can do this we can do this we can do this and oh we're, we're, we're in this and and they said if you're really really good if you really know what you're doing your wife will be able to give birth without any pain medication that is the sign that you are a great coach they actually told me that. <laughs> so, I'm going to get Jelly Valamont the prize. She's going to have the prize that there is no pain medication. We're going to hee hee and ho ho this thing. We're going through this baby. We're going to, we're going to do this. We are going to do this together. So we, we're in there and we're hee hee and ho ho. And, and she says, I need some drugs. So baby, don't worry. Don't worry, we'll get through this. So I knew she was, I, I took the washcloth and I, I wet it with, and I was getting ready to wipe her face and she said, you're messing up my makeup. <laughs> now, I explained to her that I am the coach And then all of a sudden she said, again, give me some drugs. But the voice that came out of my sweet, petite, wonderful, godly woman was a different voice. It was a deep, gurgly voice. I'm not saying it was the devil or anything. I'm just saying I'd never heard that voice before. And she said, give me some drugs. And I said, baby, don't worry. We got this. I'm in charge. We're going to get you through. You're going to get the prize. And about that time, she reached up, <laughs> grabbed me, <laughs> pulled me down, and in my face yelled. I said it with that deep, gurgly voice, give me some drugs. And I gently but firmly got her fingers off my neck. And I said, just remember, I'm in charge. Doc, get her the drugs. <laughs> and I, I, I was thinking about that, how that uh, it must have been a very interesting time when Jesus was born. I mean, some of you think that it was just perfect. But you ever think that Jesus didn't have a midwife there? The poor Joseph was there all by himself, trying to get that done by himself. Have you ever, have you ever been driving in your car, minding your own business, and the Lord show up in your car and just start talking to you and even rebuking you? Happened to me 
a week ago Saturday, I was driving back from Savannah to go to the uh, SEC championship game. Someone had bought me a ticket so I could go, and I was so excited. And, and I decided that I was going to pray the whole three hours home. I put the praise and worship on, and I was praying, and I was thanking the Lord. I'm going to get to go to the game and get to go to the game. And I was praying for people, praying for the service. I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. And I was just thanking the Lord. And, uh, and uh, in the midst of my praying and thanking, the Holy Spirit just kind of interrupted things. And he said, uh, how long do you think this is going to take this whole day? I said, oh, oh, probably the game's going to be three and a half, four hours. But, you know, if you, if you work on our side, it may not be that long. But that was an empty prayer. But anyway, uh, he said, no, from the time that you leave until the time you get home. And I said, oh, it's probably going to be about 12 hours. And he asked me a question. When's the last time you gave me 12 hours? I said, well, hey, God, every Sunday I give you 14, 16 hours. I said, no, 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 I'm not talking about ministering for me. I'm talking about being with me. Just being with me. Not for any other reason but just to be with me. When's the last time you did that? And I, I don't mind the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but it really bothers me when it goes straight to the point. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things in life as long as our priorities in life are straight. And Jesus has to be more than a season of the year, and he has to be more than a season in our lives. If Jesus really is the reason for the season, he must be the reason for our lives. And we were in staff meeting this past Monday morning, and Pastor George made some comments about this past Sunday and some of the reflections that he got out of what was taking place. And it was so profound, I wanted to share it with you. And so I asked the media team to go and capture it again, and they've done a really good job. You know, Pastor George was telling me a story of uh, some things about he and Lita, and he was telling me about how that, uh, you know, when he was driving in, at T, or driving in the car that Lita always helps him, and the boys, the boys asked their mother if their father could teach him how to drive because uh, Lita always had this wonderful way of warning George when things were coming. There would be a truck coming, and she, she will say, do you see that truck? And George said, nine out of ten times, I really do. I see that truck. And I said, uh, boy, George, you, you get away with a lot. He said, after 53 years, there's a level of grace. Amen. So today, I want to share with you some of his reflections. Hello, church family. Pastor asked me if I would share something with you that God spoke into my heart. It was Mission Sunday, which is always a special Sunday to me, and it was also the first Sunday of December, when as a church, we kind of launch into our celebration of the Christmas season. So I was enjoying the presence of God, just worshiping the Lord, and Mrs. Sandra got up to sing the song, O Holy Night, which has always been really meaningful to me. So I was enjoying that, and then she got to the line that says, fall on your knees. Well, I smiled a little bit because that line always reminds me of how our little Sean would sing that song. He would sing it, fall hurt my knees. And I thought, Lord, I, I should have been able to get it through to Sean a little bit, how that song really was meant to be sung there. But God said, that's all right. You just, you just leave that alone. Sean did okay. So I was feeling a little melancholy about thinking, Sean, another Christmas in heaven. And then I thought a little bit about our youngest son, Ryan, and his family going to Africa and how many Christmases they may be spending there without us with them. And I kind of shook it off and just went on to worship in the Lord because the presence of God was real. Pastor began to preach a great message Sunday morning. And towards the end of that message, he began to speak about the two young missionaries who were called to go preach the gospel in Moravia. To make a long story short, the only way they could do that was to sell them slave, themselves as slaves. So they did that. And as they're leaving on the slave ship, pulling away from the shore, their family and friends on the 
shore there, they raised their hands and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. May he receive a reward for his suffering. Well, I, I got to thinking about that. What does Christmas really mean? And I went back to the song that Sandra had been singing, oh, that old holy night. And what it really means to bow down on our knees and fall down before God. And I thought, you know, sometimes the journey that puts us on may cause a little hurt. But is it worth it? What is the worth of a soul? So I thought again about Ryan and his family going to Africa. And God just told me, you know, it's not about if your family is gathered around your Christmas tree at Christmas time. That's not what Christmas is about. Christmas is about God seeing a world lost in sin and sending his only begotten son. And so if people are gonna leave their families at Christmas time to go proclaim that message, is that worth it to you? All I can say is, God, don't let Ryan stay here. Send him to Africa. Because no, it's not about me. It's not about my family. I love Christmas, I love everything about it. But most of all, I love that Jesus came as the light of the world to bring light into the darkness and to bring souls into the kingdom. And I just want our Christmas to be all about Jesus. If it can be about Him, I pray that that will be pleasing in His sight. Thank you for letting me share a little bit about what God spoke to me. God bless you and Merry Christmas. You know, as he, was, as he was sharing that with us in our executive staff meeting, I was, I was thinking about the different levels of commitment that Mary had to have, and I want to share that with you today, the level of commitment. In Acts chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, it tells us that the early church had a level of commitment. In fact, it was in Antioch that there the disciples were first called Christians, and that, that word Christian then doesn't mean what it means today. It, it was a different meaning. You know, today uh, we understand some things, but in the early church, there were three levels of commitment. The first level was to become a believer. That's when you accepted Christ and were baptized in water. The second level of commitment was to be called a disciple. And according to the scriptures, um, that word disciple in the original Greek language is an interesting word because we get the word discipline from the word disciple. And ladies and gentlemen, in that particular passage, we understand that disciple means an ardent follower of Jesus. They, they followed the Lord. They listened to the apostles' doctrine. They, they were together as much as they could. It was an important part of who they were. But when they got to Antioch, they were so much a part of who Jesus was that they called them Christians. Now today we would think, oh, that's a, that's a great thing. But let me share with you how that terminology was used. How would you like to be called a little Hitler? Or worse, how would you like to be called part of the Mas Manson family? Or worse yet, how would you like to be called Osama bin Laden? It was, it was something known as a negative thing, but they were so much like Christ that they were saying, those are Christians. Those people are turning the world upside down. They're, they're telling us about a God who only has to be worshipped, not a pluralistic God, but a singular God. And so it was different. In today, it's not like that, is it? In today... There's a lot of different changes. What if Mary had said, all I want is a nine-month commitment to Gabriel. I will birth him, but I really don't want to change his diapers. I don't want to wipe his dirty butt. And I, or what about this? I'll, I'll birth him, I'll raise him, but I don't want anything a part of the teenage years because teenage years are so hard. I, I don't want anything to do with that. The question is, what's happening to the American church? A couple, about five weeks ago, I came across these statistics in a leadership meeting I was in in San Antonio, Texas. And these statistics are, are the Church of America as a whole and what's been happening in the last 20 years. And they used a church of a thousand as a statistical basis for it. And I'll show you what it is as it comes up on the screen. It shows us that in 1995, a church of a thousand, 40% of its people would attend on Sunday morning four times a month, 40% would attend three times a month, 10% would attend two times a month, and 10% would attend 
would attend one time a month, which is average weekly attendance of, of 775. And the average person in the church would be there three out of four Sunday mornings. Now fast forward to 2016, across the board in America, look at the same church running a thousand, and then look with me and notice that 10% of its attendees attend four times a month on a Sunday, 15% attend three times a month, 35% attend two times a month, and 40% attend once a month. And you know this with me that the average attendance went from 750 to about 480. And notice with me that 20 years ago, the average church, 75% of its people were there almost all the time, but today, only 25% of its people are there 75% of the time. And I was reading uh, Thomas Rayner, who's a great Christian author, and he's written some great things. He says this, if the current trajectory continues, the American church will pass the tipping point. Our congregations will become a likely unstoppable path toward decline that will rival many European churches of the past century. And most of you don't understand what he just said because you would have to go to Europe to understand it, but I, I have been to Europe. In fact, I met Pastor George and Miss Leader there almost 20 years ago, and we walked into the great Baptist church there where the great Charles Spurgeon pastored and the church was a shell of what it used to be. And I was asking questions because at one time that church in the 1850s was running 5,000 and now it was only running 400. And he told me that if Methodism continued to decrease like it was, that 20 years ago there would be no Methodism in England in five years. Today in England, the Muslim religion is almost twice as strong as the Christian religion in England today. Now, Europe was the home and Germany was the home of the great Martin Luther of the Protestant Reformation, excuse me, where he said, the just shall live by faith. And it was there in Gutenberg that the first Bible was really printed. And I have a page out of one of the Bibles that was printed in Gutenberg, not the first ones, but ones years after. This page is almost four, is over 400 years old, and I was able to go. There was a man in Indianapolis who invited me to his place of business, and he had a vault in the back that had over $12 million worth of old Bibles there, and um, he allowed me to come back in, and he had one of the Bibles that he would give a leaf out to certain people that he allowed to come in. And he asked me what leaf I had. And I asked for the leaf where Elijah called fire down from heaven. And so this is one of these. This is, this is what it looked like. And this was important because before the Gutenberg Bible was printed and before Bibles were printed, the only people who knew the scripture were the priests and they read it in Latin. So you had to just believe everything they said. And the printing of the Bible was part of the reason why the Great Reformation took place. <coughs> But then I think about England, who brought us the great Wesley brothers, who Jonathan Wesley was a great man, a great preacher in the Methodist movement. Many of you don't know this, but at one time, the Methodists were Pentecostals. They believed in the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They believed in the inerrancy of Scripture. In fact, in the camp meetings in the 1840s and 50s, the term holy roller came out of those Methodist camp meetings because those Methodists would be slain under the power of the Holy Spirit and they would pick them up like cordwood and put them in the back of wagons and take them off, so slain by the power of the Holy Spirit. But today in England, that too has diminished. And if you were to go to Europe today and look at all of Europe, it has now become the dark continent because there's more Christians in Asia, in Africa, in Central and South America, and there's more Christians in North America, there's more Christians in the Antarctic area than there is in Europe. Europe right now has 1.2, 1.5% of its total population is Christian because something began to happen. The church began to wane and church attendance and church participation became something of a fad and not of a lifestyle. Notice with me that Mary rode a donkey for 98 miles over an eight to 10 day period while she was pregnant and great with child. It reminded me 
about 20 years ago when Jennifer was pregnant with Chandler. And we had a, we had a executive pastor at that time of the name of Tim Newby. And Tim Newby had a name for everybody. And there was nothing that Tim Newby would not make fun of. And I remember Jennifer was great with child. And she was, she was ready to give birth. Uh, she was probably three weeks away. And she was standing in choir. And she was in the other sanctuary. And she was backing up. And Tim Newby thought it would be funny. And as she started backing up, he started going, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> and I've never seen a pregnant lady turn on somebody so fast. She turned around and said, Tim Newby, if you want to live, you're going to stop that right now. That's not real. And he <laughs> threw his hands up and he said, I'm sorry. And boy, was he from that point on. But can you imagine what it was like for Joseph to take Mary 98 miles on a donkey during the last stages and the kind of commitment and patience and strength he had to have? My question today is, do we want a nine-month Jesus church? Is that what we're willing to commit to? Are we willing to commit to a Christ for our whole life? I see some people that dedicate themselves to Christ while their kids are young or while their kids are teenagers, but when that's over with, they feel like they've done their job. Aren't you glad that Mary didn't think that way? My heart breaks for a generation that will have parents that care more about their children's eternal destiny than anything else that's going on in their child's life. The second thing Mary had was the love of Christ. And I asked the question this Christmas season, how much do we really love Jesus? You know, love in our culture is a very subjective word. You ask 100 people what love means and you'll probably get 150 different answers. Some would say it's a feeling. Others say it defines a commitment. Still others would say it that is some trite saying like, if you love me, let it go. And if it's true love, it will come back to you. I don't know what that means, but somebody came up with it. The scripture tells us that the, there's three different types of love. The Greek verbiage and the Greek language described it. The first type of love is called phileo, and that's called a brotherly love. And, and a brotherly love is a good love, but you and I both know that have brothers. Brothers are there when you need them but they're not there all the time. You've got to call a brother and the brother will come if he's a real brother and he'll be there. The other kind of love is called eros. And that word eros in the Greek, we get the English word erotic from and it means a sensual love between a man and a woman. And that's a good love. And, and we all, when you get married, that's part, of, that's part of getting married. She looks good, he looks good. But if all you have is eros love when she gets older and he gets older and and uh, things start shifting in your bodies and things start disappearing on your bodies. If you don't have more than Eros love, then all that goes away and people end up finding other people. Then the third type of love is called agape love. That's the unconditional love that is favorable and loves people regardless of circumstance or situation. That's the kind of love Jesus and our Heavenly Father has for us, that unconditional love. Most of you know I love history and I enjoy history. Daniel Boone was a historic figure that most of us have read about and know about. He was an interesting man and he had a lot of stories. I was told one story that in one day he killed 25 black bears and skinned them all in one day. And those of you that have ever hunted, you know what it's like to skin one deer, yet alone skin a bear and skin it and kill 25 bears in one day. How do you do that? Because in that day and time, you had to be about as close as me to Christian to be able to shoot that mu muzzle that far. And you come up against 25 bears and do that, uh, you're much of a man. One time in Daniel Boone's history, he was, he was captured by Indians. For some reason, Daniel Boone, when he was 43, as he was captured, he he had favor with them. And he found out during his capture that these Indians were going to attack his home, which was called Boonesboro. And after he found out, this is what history says. His writings, on the 16th of June, before sunrise, I departed in the most secret manner and arrived at Boonesboro on the 18th after a journey of 160 miles, which I had but one meal. 
and history says he left off on foot over the Appalachian Mountains. Two hours after he arrived in Boonesboro, those 450 Indians showed up. And when those 450 Indians showed up, he and those residents of Boonesboro fought them off for 10 days and defeated the Indians. And ladies and gentlemen, I thought about what was it that caused a man to be able to move that fast, 160 miles in two days, traveling 80 miles like that in two days, running for his life, having 450 Indians after him, but running so fast that he could, he could get to his family and warn his family of the impending judgment. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you today that if we're not careful, if we don't wake up, America's going to look like Europe. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be Europe. I don't want America to look like Europe. This is the land of the free, the home of the brave. God has ordained some things to happen in this nation. And I personally believe God's not done yet. But more than that, we are believers. The world looks at us and says we're, a, we're the uh, city set on a hill, a light shining in darkness. Still to this day, no other nation in the world sends more missionaries around the world than the United States of America. But what is happening to the church? What is happening to us? My heart breaks for children. Last Sunday night, we had a great service, a miracle service. <clears throat> At the end of the service, a little girl came down and asked me to pray for her. And she said, would you pray for me? And her heart was broken because her father was no longer part of her life and she wanted me to pray that her little heart would not be come bitter. Over here on this side, there was another young man who came and stood and said, Pastor, pray for me. I long for God. I want more of God. I want more of the things of God. And I thought... Here are two extremely different needs, but both of those needs were met because their parents thought enough to bring them to the house of God where they could be exposed to the presence of God. Beloved, let me tell you something today. We live in the most dangerous time that our nation has ever had. In 300 years that we have been colonies and have been in existence, we live in the most biblically illiterate time that we have ever had in today if there ever was a time that the church needed to come together and the church needed to be a part of what Jesus wants us to do. It's this day and this time. And then finally, look with me as our musicians come at the legacy of the cause. What will your children and grandchildren say about your spirituality after you're gone? Now, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> I want to live until Jesus comes. I'd rather go to heaven by way of the rapture than by way of the grave. I'm just going to tell you that right up front. Say, are you afraid to die? I don't think so. I don't want to. I want to go by the rapture. But <clears throat> I've had two sets of grandparents. One really didn't know the Lord and didn't have a big influence in my life. But the other, my grandpa and grandpa Luke and so, boy, they knew Jesus. And what an effect they had on my life. And my, I want my children, grandchildren to know that I fought for them spiritually as well as physically in any other way I could. But, you know, your, your children, putting them in college is important. Giving them a good home is important. It provided for them is important. But ladies and gentlemen, a million years from now, and everyone in this building will live for a million years. All of you hear me. You will live for a million years, not in the body you have right now, but in eternity. In a million years from now, they're not going to remember if you played catch with them or attended a, a concert or took them here and there. What they're going to remember is what did you do for them spiritually? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Parents, society puts you under a guilt trip. But I'm telling you today, can your children quote the books of the Bible? Can they quote scripture? That's the most important thing. All these, I love sports, you know I do. But I can't play like I used to.
can't play at all. I sit in the stands now. Yeah. And I'm the coach on the couch now. But I remember standing with my grandfather and holding his hand when he sang a song in church. And I remember what my grandfather called me and how the influence he had in my life. And even after I became an adult, the influence, the spiritual influence my grandfather and my parents had in my life. I remember what my grandmother called me. I miss my grandmother. I have pictures in my office. My grandmother, she never called me Randy. <laughs> she always called me my Randy. You'd think I'd forget that. She's been gone almost 15, 18 years, but I don't. I was always my Randy. My Randy, my Randy, my Randy, my Randy, come here, my Randy. I was thinking about that the other day, looking at the pictures. And I remember my grandmother. She'd give me a quarter. She'd say, pay your tithes on this. Well, how am I going to do that? Don't. She said, well, keep three cents out. Don't spend it all on the candy. Keep some out. And when we pray, we'd have the whole family together for Easter or Christmas. And we'd begin to pray. My grandfather would pray and he would pray the biscuits cold. And it, when you got to a certain level, you got to sit next to my grandparents. And I got to the level that I got to sit next to my grandparents. And my grandfather was praying and, and I reached out to get a biscuit and he took the back of the knife and slapped my hands and never missed praying at the same time. I, I remember that. What legacy are we leaving our children and our grandchildren? You see, Mary was there in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. She went looking for Jesus when he was left in Jerusalem at age 12. She was there in Cana of Galilee for the first miracle and told them, do what he says. Mary was there, ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus went to the cross. She was there at the foot of the cross when she saw her beloved son hanging there. And she heard what Jesus said to John. He said, woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. She was also there when three days later they went to anoint his body at the tomb. Mary was there. And then when Jesus was to be ascended at the Mount of Olives, Mary was there. When the day of Pentecost happened, 10 days later in the upper room, the Bible says Mary was there. And when John moved to Ephesus, church tradition says that Mary was there and buried somewhere there in Ephesus because she just didn't say, I'm going to give you a nine month or I'm going to give you the first half of my life or the first third of my life or the first whatever. Mary committed to Jesus her whole life. And beloved, we, we've become a people that have said, Lord, we'll give you this much and we'll give you that much. But Jesus wants what Mary gave him, what he told, what she told the angel. Be it unto me according to your word. Lord Jesus, whatever you need from my life, I give it to you. I close with this, her, her legacy was she was faithful all throughout her life. We all know family and friends and loved ones who are not what they used to be, right? Who once served the Lord with vibrancy that, that don't today. My question, church, is do we want a nine-month Jesus, a seasonal Jesus? I, when I was praying on the way home as the Lord was talking to me, I, I said, how did this all happen? When I saw those figures, I thought, how did this happen in the church? And the Lord began to speak to me. He said, son, in 2007, when the stock market crashed and our economy went bad, people left the church then because they were serving a Jesus who could put money in their pocket. And when, when Jesus quit putting money in their pocket, their idea was he wasn't being faithful to them. So they were serving Jesus for what they could do. And, and I know you're not here because 
because of that because you made it through. And then, he's, then he showed me after that was done during, during eight years, during 2018, eight to 16, we had the greatest moral turmoil in the United States history as, as our moral underpinnings were flip-flopped and what was, what was right became wrong and what was wrong became right and the moral code and ethics was destroyed in this country. And we have a generation today that doesn't know right from wrong anymore. We got a generation today that can't even hear Jesus in the public schools or hear prayer. We, we've got that generation. We have the most biblically illiterate generation in 300 years of our nation's being colony. And then I said, God, what else happened? He said, well, after all that was done, then Satan divided this nation and there's some of you that are more intent on being a Democrat or Republican or an independent than you are being a Christian. That means more to you than saying, I'm born again. Your political stance. You'll fight and argue and you'll say stuff on, on Facebook or on social media that you would never dare say anywhere else, but you're standing up for what you believe. Really? Are you a Democrat or Republican in it, or are you a Christian? Nobody's clapping. Not sure. And the last thing the Lord told me is that this last two years there's been great wealth. And wealth can distract us if we're not careful. God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. God doesn't care if you have things as long as things don't have you. So this day, what will we do? Will we have a nine-month Jesus or will we say as Mary did during the Christmas season, be it unto me according to your word. What kind of Jesus do you want? What kind do you want for your children. Would you lead us, David? Oh, come let us adore him. Oh,